better public service for New Zealanders, rebuilding Christchurch, building a more competitive economy. I call Thank you. The Honourable Clayton Cosgrove. Mr Chairman, well, we've heard it, we've heard it here. We've heard it here and we should, it will go down in the annals of this parliament as Todd McClay wraps his arms firmly around John Banks. Firmly around John Banks. The political version of a human piñata in this House being pinged every day for his conduct. The walking dead. The political version of a cadaver that is hanging this government together that they are selling our assets that people already own on the vote of John Banks. The human political cadaver. And Todd McClay gets up and says, and flings his arms around John Banks like a lifeline. Well, I'm going to enjoy quoting that for years to come. Here's the, here is the issue with this budget, with these appropriations, with this finance. Uh, this government is responsible for some achievements. That is true. Exports, down. Uh, the current account deficit, up. Unemployment, up. And a thousand people a week, a thousand people a week, leaving for overseas. All these things that the English key government said they would fix, said they would fix. And I don't want to get onto tourism because we've done it. The only thing I will say, Sue, as we're talking about jobs, is if one consults page three, page 583 of the tourism estimates, we asked the tourism minister about jobs, job creation in relation to the cycleway, right? Because this finance appropriation helps to fund that. He couldn't tell us how many businesses, how many permanent jobs were created thus far by the silver bullet of this government, which was to be a cycleway. The Minister of Tourism couldn't tell us. He could give us a few anecdotes about a fish and chip shop that had opened in Napier, and apparently the local cycle uh, shop in Napier is going gangbusters. But apart from that, couldn't name how many permanent jobs had been uh, created. So we know a thousand people a week are leaving their shores. And I say to Mr Calder, not, a, not about Greece, as Mr Parker said. Mr Calder spent 90% of his speech ironically talking about every other country in the world except the one that he represents in this parliament. Talked about Greece, talked about Spain, talked about uh, Ireland, talked about the US and every other country except the one that he is in charge of as part of this government. And we look at asset sales. Now, I remember, I remember a debate during the election campaign, the famous show me the money debate. Remember that? Well, I say to this government, because this government is always, always quick to hold everybody else's feet to the fire in terms of fiscal prudence and fiscal accountability and costings. And we had an example of utter, no, I can't say that, it's the H word. We had an example of saying one thing outside this parliament and doing another inside this parliament when it came to the asset sales loyalty scheme. Because we had a Prime Minister get up at his conference, oh, come out as if, you know, oh, everybody loves this Prime Minister coming out of his conference, so the National Party people said, people are going to love this asset sales, and announced a loyalty scheme without one dollar of costings having been done announced a mi hundreds of millions of dollars worth of loyalty bonus shares scheme and when asked in this parliament how much was it going to cost, where's the dough coming from, what's the counterfactual in terms of losses to the taxpayer and the Crown providing these free shares for those who can afford a thousand or two thousand dollars, not one shred of evidence or data to back up the policy. Now if that had been us, Oh, would we have been shredded by the National Party for not costing things? But it's OK to d d dish it out, but it's not OK to be accountable when you're in government and announce a major plank of a policy costing hundreds of millions of dollars so that those at the top, again, can get a nice little, a major wealth transfer in bonus shares and those who, stick, who have their nose pressed against the glass who cannot afford the thousand and two thousand dollars you need to get in to buy back what they already own, they end up paying for it. So I say to Mr English, I'd be really interested, uh, as is addressed in the report of the Finance Expenditure Committee, if he could tell us the costings around the loyalty scheme. If he could also tell us that if his government is so certain, as they told us week after week and month after month, that Kiwi mums and dads, one would be first in the queue and secondly would hold on to these shares infinitum because it was such a good deal. I'd like him to tell us if he's so confident of that, how it is, sir, how it is that he needs a loyalty scheme. 
And I'd like him to tell us when is this loyalty scheme going to uh, mature? Is it going to mature in, Mr. Chair? Honourable Mr. Payton Chair, Cosgrove. is it going to mature, sir, this loyalty scheme prior to the next election? Oh no. The stated position on the loyalty scheme is that it will mature after the next election, about I think about six months. They said it was going to be a three-year scheme. Six months. Quite a coincidence, my colleague, Mr. Clark, says. Why is that a coincidence? That is a cynical con, because that is simply about the government being able to try and cobble together an argument in the next election campaign that, oh, look at all these Kiwis, they're hanging in there, they're keeping their shares, uh, we told you so, Mr Key will say, and then, hey presto, six months after an election campaign, the free bonus shares will mature and be delivered, and the same thing that happened with Contact Energy will occur in that Kiwi mums and dads will sell out, they'll win full gain, those that remain, and of course those that have got in to get that windfall gain will be those Kiwi mums and dads who can afford $1,000 to flick onto the old share market or $2,000. I don't see many of them in Christchurch or around the country. And by the way, if you're paying 20% on your credit card and you're going to get 5% maybe off the, uh, off the back of these asset sales, then wouldn't the smart thing to do, and I don't think many financial advisers would disagree with me, would be to pay your credit card off or pay down your mortgage if you had one or two thousand dollars discretionary just hanging around in your back pocket. But the point is this, that yet again, and I know uh, Mr Goldsmith, the, the member for, no he's not the member for Epsom, I got confused there for a minute, the soon to be member for Epsom, I know he'll be able to afford a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks, and most people I wager in his electorate will probably be able to have a go, and that's the nature of it. But for those people on Struggle Street, those people who don't have a hundred bucks to get the kids a couple of new pairs of school shoes, or to pay the school fees, or to put bread on the table, I can't see too many of them sitting around talking, you know, mum talking to dad saying, hey, we're going to dig up a thousand bucks or two thousand dollars, and you know what we're going to do? We're scratching to make ends meet, but we're going to take Bill English's advice, and we're going to invest in shares that we already own, and we're going to buy them back again. So let's get real about this. This is about a wealth transfer. This from the least to those who have the most. This is also about an election year con. And I just ask Mr English again, if he is so confident that Kiwi mums and dads will hang on to these shares, why does he need a loyalty bonus? There is no answer apart from the fact that he knows the inevitable will happen. Contact Energy, when they floated in 1999, they had a share register of 225,000 Kiwi individual shareholders. Today, that is 78,000, and that company is overwhelmingly and predominantly owned by foreign interests, most of them in Australia. So I just say to Mr English, if I'm wrong, and he can laugh and cackle, but if I'm wrong, stand up, take a call, and tell the House why it is he has promoted a loyalty share scheme if he does believe in his heart of hearts that Kiwis will hang on to these shares. And it will not be the case, say, in three years, just after the loyalty scheme expires, that the share registry register is turned on its head because the Kiwis go out with their windfall gain and the foreign investors move in, which has been precedent after precedent with historic asset sales. Eighty per cent of New Zealanders don't want it. Mr English has botched this from stem to stern. He has inflamed Maori interests. He has not spoken. We had two Furry Tower come to the committee, lawyered up, saying that they had gifted back water, uh, water resources to the Crown for the public good. But now the rules have changed and they wanted a slice of the action. What was the government's reaction to that? Well, according to Mr Ryle in this House, they'd planned for all this. So they'd planned for a dust-up with Maoridom. They'd planned for a Waitangi tribunal hearing, and they'd planned, presumably, for the inevitable court action that will follow, and therefore the That's delay right. in the IPO. Right. Now, only a fool, to quote Mr Key, would float an asset, would do an IPO with court action and tribunal action hanging over their head. I say this to Mr English. 
He will go down in history as the person that dudded, to use an Australian expression, dudded the Kiwi taxpayer by selling assets that they already own, dudded them because the least in our community could not afford to buy them, dudded them because he transferred the wealth to the most, and then dudded them with a loyalty issue which should be unnecessary if he believes in his heart of hearts that Kiwis will hang on to these shares. Dudded the taxpayer, that will be his leg legacy, and that will what, what is what we will go to the next election about. I call Paul Goldsmith. Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm very glad to hear from the member for Struggle Street. Uh, by